Chapter Eight of *The Turn of the Screw* by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What I had said to Mrs. Groves was true enough. There were in the matter I had put before her depths and possibilities that I lacked resolution to sound. So that when we met once more in the wonder of it, we were of a common mind about the duty of resistance to extravagant fancies. We were to keep our heads if we should keep nothing else. Difficult indeed as that might be in the face of what, in our prodigious experience, was least to be questioned. Late that night, while the house slept, we had another talk in my room, when she went all the way with me as to its being beyond doubt that I had seen exactly what I had seen. To hold her perfectly in the pinch of that, I found I had only to ask her how, if I had made it up, I came to be able to give, of each of the persons appearing to me, a picture disclosing to the last detail their special marks, a portrait on the exhibition of which she had instantly recognised and named them. She wished, of course, small blame to her, to sink the whole subject, and I was quick to assure her that my own interest in it had now violently taken the form of a search for the way to escape from it. I encountered her on the ground of a probability that with recurrence, for recurrence we took for granted, I should get used to my danger, distinctly professing that my personal exposure had suddenly become the least of my discomforts. It was my new suspicion that was intolerable, and yet even to this complication the later hours of the day had brought a little ease. On leaving her, after my first outbreak, I had, of course, returned to my pupils, associating the right remedy for my dismay with that sense of their charm which I had already found to be a thing I could possibly cultivate, and which had never failed me yet. I had simply, in other words, plunged afresh into Flora's special society, and there became aware—it was almost a luxury—that she could put her little conscious hand straight upon the spot that ached. She had looked at me in sweet speculation, and then had accused me to my face of having cried. I had supposed I had brushed away the ugly signs. But I could literally, for the time at all events, rejoice under this fathomless charity that they had not entirely disappeared. To gaze into the depths of blue of the child's eyes, and pronounce their loveliness a trick of premature cunning, was to be guilty of a cynicism in preference to which I naturally preferred to abjure my judgment, and, so far as might be, my agitation. I couldn't abjure for merely wanting to, but I could repeat to Mrs. Groves, as I did there over and over in the small hours, that with their voices in the air, their pressure on one's heart, and their fragrant faces against one's cheek, everything fell to the ground but their incapacity and their beauty. It was a pity that, somehow, to settle this once for all, I had equally to re-enumerate the signs of subtlety, that in the afternoon by the lake had made a miracle of my show of self-possession. It was a pity to be obliged to reinvestigate the certitude of the moment itself, and repeat how it had come to me as a revelation that the inconceivable communion I then surprised was a matter for either party of habit. It was a pity that I should have had to quaver out again the reasons for my not having, in my delusion, so much as questioned that the little girl saw our visitant even as I actually saw Mrs. Groves herself, and that she wanted, by just so much as she did thus see, to make me suppose she didn't, and at the same time, without showing anything, arrive at a guess as to whether I myself did. It was a pity that I needed once more to describe the portentous little activity by which she sought to divert my attention, the perceptible increase of movement, the greater intensity of play, the singing, the gabbling of nonsense, and the invitation to romp. Yet if I had not indulged, to prove there was nothing in it, in this review I should have missed the two or three dim elements of comfort that still remained to me. I should not, for instance, have been able to asseverate to my friend that I was certain, which was so much to the good, that I at least had not betrayed myself. I should not have been prompted by stress of need, by desperation of mind, 
I scarce know what to call it, to invoke such further aid to intelligence as might spring from pushing my colleague fairly to the wall. She had told me, bit by bit, under pressure, a great deal, but a small shifty spot on the wrong side of it all still sometimes brushed my brow like the wing of a bat, and I remember how, on this occasion, for the sleeping house and the concentration alike of our danger and our watch seemed to help, I felt the importance of giving the last jerk to the curtain. "'I don't believe anything so horrible,' I recollect saying. "'No, let us put it definitely, my dear, that I don't. But if I did, you know, there's a thing I should require now, just without sparing you the least bit more, oh, not a scrap, come, to get out of you.' What was it you had in mind when, in our distress, before Miles came back over the letter from his school, you said, under my insistence, that you didn't pretend for him that he had not literally ever been bad? He has not literally ever in these weeks that I myself have lived with him, and so closely watched him. He has been an imperturbable little prodigy of delightful lovable goodness. Therefore you might perfectly have made the claim for him if you had not, as it happened, seen an exception to take. What was your exception? And to what passage in your personal observation of him did you refer?" It was a dreadfully austere inquiry, but levity was not our note, and at any rate, before the grey dawn admonished us to separate, I had got my answer. What my friend had had in mind proved to be immensely to the purpose. It was neither more nor less than the circumstance that, for a period of several months, Quint and the boy had been perpetually together. It was, in fact, the very appropriate truth that she had ventured to criticise the propriety, to hint at the incongruity of so close an alliance, and even to go so far in the subject as a frank overture to Miss Jessel. Miss Jessel had, with a most strange manner, requested her to mind her business, and the good woman had, on this, directly approached little Miles. What she had said to him, since I pressed, was that she liked to see young gentlemen not forget their station. I pressed again, of course, at this. You reminded him that Quint was only a base menial. As you might say, and it was his answer for one thing that was bad. And for another thing? I waited. He repeated your words to Quint. No, not that. It's just what he wouldn't. She could still impress upon me. I was sure at any rate, she added, that he didn't. But he denied certain occasions. What occasions? When they had been about together quite as if Quint were his tutor, and a very grand one, and Miss Jessel only for the little lady. When he had gone off with the fellow, I mean, and spent hours with him. He then prevaricated about it. He said he hadn't. Her assent was clear enough to cause me to add in a moment. I see. He lied. Oh! Mrs. Groves mumbled. This was a suggestion that it didn't matter, which indeed she backed up by a further remark. You see, after all, Miss Jessel didn't mind. She didn't forbid him." I considered. Did he put that to you as a justification? At this she dropped again. No, he never spoke of it. Never mentioned her in connection with Quint? She saw, visibly flushing, where I was coming out. Well, he didn't show anything. He denied, she repeated. He denied. Lord, how I pressed her now! So that you could see he knew what was between the two wretches? I don't know! I don't know! The poor woman groaned. You do know, you dear thing, I replied. Only you haven't my dreadful boldness of mind, and you keep back, out of timidity and modesty and delicacy, even the impression that, in the past, when you had, without my aid, to flounder about in silence, most of all made you miserable. But I shall get it out of you yet. There was something in the boy that suggested to you, I continued, that he covered and concealed their relation. Oh, he couldn't prevent! You're learning the truth, 
I dare say. But heavens! I fell with vehemence a-thinking. What it shows that they must to that extent have succeeded in making of him. Oh, nothing that's not nice now, Mrs. Groves lugubriously pleaded. I don't wonder you looked queer, I persisted, when I mentioned to you the letter from his school. I doubt if I looked as queer as you, she retorted with homely force. And if he was so bad then as that comes to, how is he such an angel now? Yes, indeed. And if he was a fiend at school, how? How, how? Well, I said in my torment, you must put it to me again, but I shall not be able to tell you for some days. Only put it to me again, I cried in a way that made my friend stare. There are directions in which I must not for the present let myself go. Meanwhile I returned to her first example, the one to which she had just previously referred, of the boy's happy capacity for an occasional slip. If Quint, on your remonstrance at the time you speak of, was a base menial, one of the things Miles said to you, I find myself guessing, was that you were another." Again her admission was so adequate that I continued. And you forgave him that? Wouldn't you? Oh, yes. And we exchanged there in the stillness a sound of the oddest amusement. Then I went on. At all events, while he was with the man. Miss Flora was with the woman. It suited them all. It suited me, too, I felt, only too well, by which I mean that it suited exactly the particularly deadly view I was in the very act of forbidding myself to entertain. But I so far succeeded in checking the expression of this view, that I will throw, just here, no further light on it than may be offered by the mention of my final observation to Mrs. Groves. His having lied and been impudent are, I confess, less engaging specimens than I had hoped to have from you of the outbreak in him of the little natural man. Still, I mused, they must do, for they make me feel more than ever that I must watch. It made me blush the next minute to see in my friend's face how much more unreservedly she had forgiven him than her anecdote struck me as presenting to my own tenderness an occasion for doing. This came out when, at the schoolroom door, she quitted me. "'Surely you don't accuse him?' "'Of carrying on an intercourse that he conceals from me. "'Ah, remember that, until further evidence, I now accuse nobody.' Then, before shutting her out to go by another passage to her own place, "'I must just wait,' I wound up. End of chapter 8